Welcome to Hot Chips 27. Session 2. Multimedia and Signal Processing. Welcome back from lunch. Uh, my name is John Davis from Pure Storage. Uh, we're going to start the multimedia and signal processing uh, section uh, session. Uh, we've got a lot of exciting speakers here to talk about various things from DSPs to GPUs and some other flavors. I have two important announcements. Uh, number one, I've been told that the internet is up and running, so over the course of the afternoon, please use it sparingly. Uh, second, we are updating the slides on the internal website as well as an external website. The external website um, password is make deep, all one word. So you'll be seeing those uh, either internally or externally. Uh, the external stuff will happen at the end of uh, today. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. His name is Lucien uh, Kodrescu. He is from Qualcomm, and uh, he is the chief architect of the Qualcomm Hexagon family of DSP processors. He's been working on those for over 10 years, where they've delivered six compatible uh, generations of Hexagon. They've uh, shipped in excess of a billion cores per year. Um, he's worked at Freescale, Motorola, General Electric, has over 89 uh, patents pending or uh, patented, uh, granted, excuse me, and has a PhD from Georgia Tech. With that, I will hand it over to Lucian. All right. Uh, so everybody's back from lunch. Uh, you have internet now, which means I have a really hard job to keep everyone's attention. Uh, I'll do my best. Um, we were here at Hot Chips two years ago. Uh, we introduced the Hexagon DSP for the first time. Um, and now we're back today to tell you guys what we've been working on. Um, we're going to focus on the uh, DSP cores that are in the upcoming Snapdragon 820. Uh, there are actually three hexagon cores in this product. Uh, the first one uh, is embedded inside the modem, uh, the modem DSP. Uh, Qualcomm does not disclose anything about its modem technology, so we're not going to be talking about that today. Uh, the second DSP is what we call the Low Power Island DSP. Its job is to uh, do the always-on, low-power sensor applications. It was purpose-built to be a very small, very low-power core uh, that's embedded inside of a low-power island. We think of it kind of as a sensor hub inside of the chip. Um, there's a lot of really interesting technology inside that guy, uh, but due to the 25-minute uh, talk today, we simply didn't have any time to do it justice, uh, so we've decided to talk about that one at another time. And today, we're going to focus on the Compute DSP. Um, if you remember two years ago, if you saw that talk, we talked about our DSP doing uh, audio and voice and, and sort of trying to get into image processing. Um, well, that's really what we've been working on since then. Uh, so we're looking at tackling applications that are very high-end, uh, 20 megapixel cameras in real time, uh, 4K video, and doing you know, advanced signal processing, things that need you know, hundreds of giga ops per second uh, to be able to do these things in real time. Things like um, you know, high definition camera, uh, you know, dual cameras, HDR, augmented and virtual reality, head mounted displays, computer vision, video post processing, lots and lots of emerging applications kind of centered around the camera on the smartphone. Um, so what we've done is we've created what we call the hexagon vector extensions. HVX, which are a set of architectural extensions that extend the base DSP uh, to be able to tackle these kinds of applications. Now, our goal when we set out was not simply to uh, do the applications, but to be able to do them with extremely low power, much, much lower than you can do uh, really any other way with a programmable solution. That was our goal. Uh, so really measuring things in terms of performance per milliwatt. 
Okay, so just to give you guys kind of a little flavor of the type of applications, uh, we have a little video here. Hopefully this works. Um, you can see on the left is kind of a before and after, and this is a low light enhancement algorithm. It takes quite a lot of signal processing to do this kind of stuff, uh, but it's the type of application that when you have it on your phone and it's a low power, um, you know, it's, it's just a better smartphone, and people like these kind of things. Um, another example, uh, this time looking at a content adaptive detail enhancement. Uh, you know, you can see, hopefully this comes out okay, but you know, the, the chicken on the right there is, has a lot more detail. It's a much crisper picture. Uh, these are the kinds of things you can do with, uh, with this technology. Okay, so let's dive into what we've actually done. We're going to talk about the architecture, which is a domain-specific architectural extension for image processing. We're going to talk about the programming model. We're going to talk about how it's integrated in the system. So uh, image processing, SIMD, works great. Everybody kind of knows that. Um, we have taken it all the way up to a whopping 1024-bit. So we have a 1K bit a SIMD vector times four parallel pipelines for a total of 4096 result bits every cycle. Um, here's an example of an instruction. Uh, this is showing uh, one of 32 lanes of a, of a vector by scalar multiply instruction. In this case, it's doing four. Uh, eight by eights, accumulating them all into a 32. You can actually do two instructions like this in the VLIW packet uh, for a total of 256 uh, eight by eights or 64 16 by 16s. Uh, we have a, a full register file, 32 registers by the full vector size. Um, the design is focused and centered around fixed point, eight, 16, 32 bit, low precision fixed point. We do not do floating point. This was very intentional. Um, our, our design point is to get the lowest possible power, and as soon as you put in floating point, the power blows up. Um, also, it's, it's really not needed in, in this uh, domain that we're looking at for most of these applications. They can be coded just fine in fixed point. Um, we also have a quite capable GPU, so if you do need to do floating point, you can do that on the GPU. Um, we've put in a lot of special purpose instruction support, uh, things to do, Sliding window filters, uh, histograms, lookup tables, special permutes, uh, things that are you know, geared around the common you know, operations that you see in, in image processing. Altogether, we feel that the performance of this platform enables you to do things like uh, you know, uh, 4K video post-processing in real time, 20 megapixel camera burst shots, uh, and so forth. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the multi-threading. So Hexagon is a multi-threaded DSP. Um, if you remember our talk from two years ago, actually not a lot has changed. Uh, it's still, uh, the scalar core is, is largely the same. Um, you have, in this case, we have four threads. Each thread is a four-way VLIW. Uh, they share the memory hierarchy, L1s and L2s. Uh, each of those cores or threads runs at 500 megahertz. Uh, for a total of two gig performance across the scalar core. And so what we've done here is we've basically created this, this vector extension, these vector contexts, we call them, uh, and we put two of them. And so you can attach, um, you know, the, the vector, the, basically you have a, a program, and it can do now either regular, you know, um, scalar instructions or vector instructions or any mix of the two within the packet, the VLIW packet. Um, so we have a total of a gigahertz of vector performance in this part. Um, and the really key point about this is that while, you know, two threads are dedicated to vector processing, the other two are completely free to run and do anything else. Uh, so you can do, maybe you have some application that's got a vector part and a scalar part. You can do the scalar part in parallel uh, or, or something entirely different like audio or whatever. Um, so let's talk about memory a little bit. So you put this much computation, that's a lot, you know, that's a big beast, you got to feed the beast, right? Uh, so how do we do that? We looked at initially uh, connecting the vector units to the L1 cache, and uh, that just didn't work out. It's just too small. Uh, so what we did is we attached the vector units to the L2. Um, 
So all your vector loads and stores go directly to L2 cache. You can really think of the L2 as the primary or the L1 of the vector unit. Um, it, it provides a really nice natural programming model because you can um, you know, process you know, in, in, a, in a kind of row raster order across the image, and you don't have to worry about sort of tiling things and trying to get them to fit in your L1, which is quite difficult and comes with a lot of overhead. Uh, we have a single cycle load to use. So you do a vector load. You can use it in the next cycle. Um, it's a great programming model. It makes the compiler generates very tight code with this. Uh, the physically, the design, of course, you know, there's more cycles involved in, in going to L2 and coming back. Uh, but we hide all of that in the microarchitecture. So the programming model sees effectively one cycle loads. Uh, we keep the caches coherent. Uh, we have a streaming prefetch mechanism between DDR and L2. Uh, and we have a wide variety of vector instructions. You can do aligned, unaligned, conditional, byte conditional, many different things. OK, so you know, we wanted to just give you a little bit of the high, the high points of the, the architecture. It's domain specific for imaging, uh, wide vectors, low precision fixed point, uh, vector and, and scalar in parallel, and a, and a big primary cache. Let's talk a little bit about the programming model. So when you introduce a new architecture, you know, you got to get people to program it. If people can't program it, if it's too hard to program, it won't be successful. Uh, so our philosophy on the easiest way to get people to, to do this is just to make it familiar, make it look like what they already know. And so a lot of people know how to program the ARM CPU with Neon. So what we've done is we said, you know, hey, you look at that programming model. You know, it's uh, multi-threading. It's cache-based. It's shared memory. Uh, you have vector instructions on the vector file, scalar instructions on the scalar file. You can do your control code. You can do your vector code. You can mix and match them all you want. Uh, you look at hexagon. It's exactly the same. Of course, it can't be identical, because then we'd just be doing a CPU. We have a good CPU team. We don't need that. Um, so what are we doing that's different? Well, the main thing is actually just we've gone so big on the SIMD. Uh, so if you compare, for example, a quad uh, CPU with 128-bit SIMD, one lane per CPU, against uh, this hexagon core, you're talking about 8x difference in compute per cycle. Uh, the next thing is in the, me in the memory system, you know, doing programming with distributed small L1s for these very big images uh, is hard, and it causes a lot of overhead. Uh, we think it's much better just to have a simple, flat memory. Uh, we have a 512K L2 that you can do, use to do this. And then the focus on you know, floating point versus fixed point, which we talked about, which is primarily a um, power statement more than anything. OK, so the programming model is many things. It's all the things that the programmer sees. It's the tools and the runtime and all that stuff. So again, we're trying to make it as, you know, conventional as possible. So we have an, an RTOS with you know, a POSIX-like threading model. We have LVM compiler. We have C and C++. Uh, we have libraries with common filters, you know, all the things that a programmer might expect. Uh, we also put a lot of work into trying to make it easy to offload to the DSP from Android. Uh, so we have a remote procedure call that you, you, know, you call this function, and your code is dynamically loaded from the ARM file system uh, into the DSP. Uh, all the buffers are taken care of. We also have frameworks. So if you're doing like a camera job or a video job, online or offline, um, you know, we, we, we have all the framework software that plugs into Android together with example applications and everything so you can get going easily. Um, while we think we've done a good job to make it easy to program, and that was a big focus, um, it would be nice if it was even easier. And uh, towards that, we're doing research in something called Halide. Halide is a domain-specific language for image processing. Um, Hexagon is a domain, HVX is a domain-specific uh, architecture for image processing. We think these two could work very well together. Uh, so we're actually doing a research pro uh, project porting Halide to Hexagon, trying to get the whole thing working and optimized. Um, it's not a production thing right now, but uh, we're hoping it's going to get there. The, you know, if, the, if this is successful, it'll give us a 
really easy to use um, programming environment, also something that's portable across any chip that supports Halide. Okay, so we've talked about uh, the architecture, we've talked about, a little bit about the programming model, uh, let's look at the system. So we've done some interesting things. Um, first one I wanna talk about is called the streaming interface. And the idea here is take the programmable uh, function and plug it directly into the ISP pipeline. In this case, we've put it between the camera sensor and the beginning of the hardware ISP. So what happens is the uh, pixels are streamed in off of the camera sensor into our streamer hardware. The streamer hardware formats them into 16 bits, uh, aligns them, pads them, writes them to L2. Uh, so everything's nicely, conveniently you know, prepared for vector processing. You then you, you do your HVX function, you do whatever kind of custom filtering or whatever you want to do. Uh, you then write it to an output buffer in L2, and then the streamer takes it the other way and streams it back directly into the hardware ISP. The advantage of this whole system uh, is all about power. No traffic goes to DDR, and we save a lot of power. Uh, we have an MMU, uh, system MMU, which allows us to you know, conveniently share data between the ARM and the, and the DSP without having to copy things around. Um, the D because the DSP is multi-threaded, you can have multiple applications offloading to the DSP at the same time, each in their own address space on the ARM, um, and our DSP has all of the context banks and the hardware to be able to handle that. Uh, it also ha gives us the ability to process secure content on the DSP, which is outside of the view of the operating system, the high-level operating system. We have a one-way coherency feature. Um, the one-way coherency is uh, that the, you know, all the traffic coming out of the DSP can snoop into the, R the CPU complex, and this uh, means that on the CPU side, you don't have to do any cache maintenance operations. On the DSP side, you do have to do that. However, um, you know, we have some things going for us. We have a smaller cache as compared to the CPU. We've built state machines that do this kind of cleaning very quickly. Uh, and also, it's all hidden in the uh, RPC layer. So the, the u net, net of it is the user doesn't have to worry about it, about the coherency. Uh, we have fairly extensive quality of service uh, mechanisms in this part. Um, you know, when you have multiple things going on at the same time, all of, many of them real time with their own different deadlines. You don't want them stomping on each other. And so we put a lot of facilities in. For example, you can partition the L2 cache. You can assign threads to partition. You can assign th priorities to threads. Uh, the memory system will arbitrate based on those priorities. Um, we have both internal QoS as well as chip-wide QoS so that the, you know, if the DSP is doing something generating tons of traffic for imaging, you know, we don't want that to you know, mess up modem timelines or, or display or something. So we have kind of a chip-wide QoS that manages all of that. Okay, so we've talked about the architecture, the programming model, a little bit about how it's integrated into the chip. Um, so you might be asking yourself, okay, well, that's great. Does it actually work? So let's look at some benchmarks. So we're gonna look at uh, a set of uh, imaging and computer vision benchmarks uh, comparing the HVX against the CPU. Uh, so in this comparison, we're comparing against the Crate CPU, uh, actually quad-core Crate running at 2.65 gigahertz, as compared to the HVX at 725 in this, in this example. Um, I'll point out here that the, app, the, the, the kernels coded on the CPU are fully optimized in Neon, Actually, what we did is we took our best Neon programmers and we said, hey, give us the best code you can, and they did. We're confident these are very well written for the ARM. Um, we're gonna look at latency as well as power. I do wanna point out that in the power, we're comparing the CPU power against the DSP power. We're not including display and DDR and other things that would you know, largely be the same between the two anyway. Okay, so first we'll look at performance. Uh, so this is in our benchmark set here. Everything is relative to the crate. Higher is better, so one is 
basically crates quad-core crates performance. Um, we're looking at anywhere from one to about three times faster than the CPUs. Um, you know, you might be wondering, does that make sense? Is that real? Uh, remember before we said that the DSP is eight times more work per cycle? Well, the CPU is running, a, you know, about four times faster almost. Um, so, you know, you might expect kind of peak, best case, about 2x advantage on the DSP. And in fact, we see somewhere between one and three. Um, what this implies is that the uh, co these codes running on the DSP are actually extremely efficient because you're getting the full compute performance. And in fact, that is what we see. Okay, so that's performance, and performance is great, but performance was not actually the key mission here. The key mission here was power. Uh, so we'll look at energy. This is energy per pixel uh, as compared to the same crate. And we're looking at, you know, numbers anywhere from 4x to as much as 18 times lower energy for the same task. Uh, which is a very, very significant difference. Okay, so this is one, you know, these are kind of smaller kernels, and, you know, one question is, okay, you know, what about an application, right? So, so we, we showed one application here. This is actually the same uh, video, post -pro you know, video processing algorithm that we showed at the beginning, that little clip, uh, the low light one, and we're seeing really the same numbers, you know, three times faster and about uh, 10 times lower energy. Okay, so, you know, that's a big difference, right? And, and you might ask yourself, well, how can that be? So let's take a little bit closer look at the power breakdown in the DSP and kind of see what's going on. Um, so here we show that, you know, this is kind of a distribution of power in the DSP running these applications. And, you know, the key point is that basically 80%, you know, sorry, almost 70% of the joules are being spent in the actual you know, math, right? This is the multiplies and the adds and the shifts, and this is the data path of the work. Uh, the next chunk is, you know, the L2, where we just are, you know, loading and storing our primary data. That's about 14%. Key thing here is that the core logic uh, is, is a small sliver. It's 7%. This is everything associated with fetching, decoding, branch prediction, dispatch, all that stuff. And, um, you know, if you've seen charts like this for the CPU, you know that that slice is much, much bigger. Uh, and the reasons are all very conventional stuff. You know, it's out of order versus in order, short vector versus long vector, using two levels of cache versus one. Um, another key point is that the design points, CPUs tend to be optimized for high speed. And, and of course, to do that, they pay a higher leakage penalty, they pay a higher clock distribution uh, power, and we don't do that on the DSP. Okay, so one thing I want to point out is that, you know, big vector processing is great. A lot of applications can use that. But, you know, we got Omdahl's law. You got your serial part. You know, what are you going to do, right? And so we think it's actually very important to have a fast scalar processor as well as a good vector processor. Um, lots of reasons for this. If you have a fast scalar processor, you don't have to try to split your application between the accelerator and the CPU. Uh, that comes with lots of programming complexities and overheads and, you know, God help if you have a dependency that runs between the cores, uh, that'll just, you know, uh, break the whole thing. Uh, and of course, you know, keeping the data local in the cache and not having to wake up the CPU is quite important for, um, for performance and power. Uh, so we did want to show here just, you know, to give a sense of the scalar performance that we're delivering uh, in, this, in this DSP. This is core marks and dry stones showing, you know, one thread doing the work. One thread you're getting, you know, uh, 4,000 core marks and, you know, three to 5,000 DMIPS, depending on how you compile it and all of that stuff. Um, and then, of course, scaling up with the more threads running. Uh, so if you go and you kind of take those numbers and you compare them to, you know, a, a, an, an ARM core and, you know, pick your favorite core, I think you'll see that those are quite, uh, quite good numbers and, and reflect the scalar performance. Okay, so, you know, we've put together this platform. It's, you know, it's, it's going to imminently ship. Uh, it's in silicon. It's in the lab. Um, we actually have a SDK. You can go out and get the SDK. Uh, you know, go to the website, request access. You can get all the code generation tools, the profilers, the libraries, the 
frameworks, everything you need to kind of get going on this guy. And, and we hope that, you know, we'll generate enough interest that a lot of people look at this and say, yeah, this is something I want to try. Um, but if you do, uh, be warned that you probably won't be the first. There are a lot of other companies out there already on this, you know, working primarily in simulators right now, but uh, starting to port and generate applications for this part. Um, so I, for one, am excited to see, you know, what all these guys are going to do, uh, what all new applications this is going to enable. And uh, with that, thank you. Uh, great talk. With that, we'll open the floor for questions. As we uh, wait for other people to have questions, one of the obvious questions I had uh, just to start the process is, how does this compare to some of the mobile GPUs that we see? Ah, the yes, thanks for asking. I knew this question was coming. Um, actually, we've just started to get data on that in the last two weeks, kind of from the lab. None of it came in time to include in here, so I didn't, I didn't get a chance to do that. I wanted to. Um, I think there's, you know, if you look at the applications, I think there's kind of two, two things that happen. One is you've got applications that have control code, and they make decisions, and they compute, and then they decide what to do next. And, it, it, you know, GPUs aren't very amenable to that kind of stuff, right? The, this guy works a lot more like a CPU in that sense. You can kind of flip, you know, vector control code as much as you want. That's one. But also, even if you look at the just plain image processing on a pure vector code, like you, you know, do some simple filter on an image, what we see is that the DSP is actually much lower power than the GPU. And the reason for this, I think, gets back to some of the basic uh, data path and uh, data type you know, choices, right? Working in fixed point is a heck of a lot smaller and low power than working in floating point. That's one. But even if you're going to take a floating point pipeline and do integer operations on that, it's still higher power because you've got a physically larger thing, probably more pipeline stages, longer wires, and more power. So, yeah. Next question on the, on the right. Thanks for the talk, uh, David Cantor. So I was wondering about the uh, relationship and how you handle the coherency between the L1 and the L2. Is it inclusive? What kind of coherency states do you have? And so forth. Um, basically, we have a write through L1, and the vector stores snoop and validate in it. That's kind of about it. So okay. it's, yeah, it's coherent. Thanks. Question on the left. Hi, John Delaney. I was wondering if you could talk about the color depth of the sensors you're using, and do you have to throw away any information in order to make it work with 32-bit integer? So um, one of the reasons that we actually put the DSP in the, you know, hard, like tried to get it in the pipeline there between the camera sensor and the ISP is because there's a lot of people looking at um, non-standard sensors, right? And so a, har a hardware, by its very nature, you make decisions up front. I'm going to work with these kinds of, hard these kinds of sensors, and, and that works. But sometimes if somebody wants to do something different, have a non-bare sensor or different you know, yeah. pixel formats and stuff, this, this is a good place where you can kind of do those conversions. In terms of the um, precision, 32 bits is a lot. We find that most stuff can be done in 16-bit just fine. So. So generally speaking, you only have four orders of magnitude between the brightest and darkest pixel. So in the kinds of applications that we're looking at, pixels are, you know, 10 to 12 bits, something like that. So Th thank you. Yeah. I just have uh, one last question. Are you guys throwing down the gauntlet to Intel in terms of the size of the vector? You have AVX 512, you guys are doing 1024. Do you have any comments on that? So I'll just say that our stuff is very application driven. And actually, through the, pro through the um, history of this project, when it started, we were actually smaller. And we actually had two doublings along the way, mostly because the application just kept growing and growing and growing. So we wanted to be able to, you know, by the time we got to market, have the right size. So that's what happened. And we'd like to thank the speaker. All right.
Next, uh, we're moving from phones and things like that to cars. Uh, we have Zoran Nikolic from TI. He's going to be talking about how to do driver-assisted uh, systems. He is a lead engineer for the Advanced Driver Assisted Systems at Texas Instruments. Uh, he's been there since 97. He has over 30 publications, and he's really focused on optimizations of SOC architectures to run the most demanding automotive vision applications in real time on solving technical challenges from an overall system architecture and sensor perspective. Thanks for the int introduction. Hi, everybody. Uh, In uh, this slide, I'll give a, a high-level overview of the presentation today. So first, we'll go over uh, some challenges of implementing advanced, advanced driver assistance systems in embedded uh, world. We'll, uh, sh I'll show the, uh, uh, some system options and uh, um, high-level uh, desc describe the uh, different um, ADAS uh, systems, and then we will. Gi I'll give an overview of the TDA SOC family, which T Texas Instruments designed, spe designed specifically uh, to be uh, to address the, the the challenges of the uh, ADAS market. And in the end of the presentation, I'll uh, give an overview and show how these SOCs fit actual uh, use cases. According to uh, worldwide. Uh, health organization in 2004, we had 1.3 million uh, people died in uh, uh, traffic accidents. And according to uh, this source, the uh, worldwide road, uh, road traffic fatalities ranked to be number nine uh, leading cause of death uh, in, in 2004. It, this number is not really uh, equally distributed over all countries, and roughly 40% of 1.3 million goes to uh, is 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 contributed by uh, deaths in 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 China and and India. It's very uh, sad statistics, and if the trend continues, the uh, road fatalities, road traffic fatalities will reach uh, fifth leading uh, cause of death worldwide by uh, uh, year 2030. So the, the main reason behind this traffic accident is uh, human error. According to a Manitza study from 1979, uh, roughly 90 to 93% of incidents uh, uh, are caused by uh, uh, human error. Uh, introducing the seat belts, introducing the airbag, uh, technology drastically reduced the uh, uh, number of uh, accidents and, and, and deaths, uh, especially like in, 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 in developed countries such as uh, United States or, or Canada. But there's still lots of room to, uh, to improve and uh, advanced driver assistance technology can save lives and reduce severity of injuries and reduce the property damage. So, so, so with this in mind, uh, uh, I'll give an overview of some of the applications for, for ADAS. Typically, uh, the system overview is uh, shown in one slide. So, so for, cl for clarity, I try to break down this information and show uh, the, each system uh, independently so we can see the uh, uh, position of the sensors and, and, and number of the sensors. Since the vision is the most commonly used modality in ADAS. I broke down the uh, vision-based ADAS in, in several slides. So uh, surround view is one application of advanced driver assistance where we use uh, uh, vision, so cameras, along with the ultrasound to help with the applications such as pedestrian detection, uh, blind spot detection, rear collision warning, cross-traffic alert, and, and park assist. The sensors are uh, positioned around the car, typically four or more sensors with the uh, uh, cameras with a, a wide field of view, 90, 190 degrees, uh, covering uh, uh, space around the, around the car. Uh, front camera application is also typically uh, vision-based uh, and uh, uh, is uh, running in a system which is placed behind the rear view mirror. Um, 
cameras are facing forward, typically with a 45 to 60 degrees field of view. And there are multiple functions running concurrently in the system, including the uh, traffic sign recognition, uh, adaptive front, front lighting, adaptive cruise control, lane departure warning, uh, blind spot detect, pedestrian detection, and so on. Uh, uh, driver monitor is an uh, emerging application uh, which is leveraging imaging sensors mounted inside the cabin. Uh, camera is uh, facing the driver and the system is uh, uh, making sure or monitoring the driver uh, face, making sure the driver is paying attention to the road. Uh, night vision applications leverage uh, near and infrared, near and far infrared uh, sensors, and depending on type of sensors used, the system is either placed behind the rear view mirror or in, in the front uh, grill. Uh, the driver assistance is also heavily leveraging radar, uh, and the radar is typically used for uh, ad uh, adaptive cruise control. Uh, it's, it's used for blind spot detection. So we have like uh, multiple radars positioned around the car, mid-range radars to, to detect the uh, obstacles or, or uh, objects around the car. Uh, sometimes, or typically, uh, radar, all, all of these sensors are uh, fused together at a high level at some point in, in a fusion box inside of a car. Uh, LIDAR is another uh, modality that is typically used in, in ADAS. It's a uh, 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 more expensive uh, 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 sensor, and it, it's used for adaptive cruise control, and it could be used for also pedestrian uh, detection. Uh, CMS, or camera monitoring system, is new um, emerging application, and basically uh, in these systems, uh, the, uh, uh, the conventional side and rear view mirror are replaced with the digital mirrors. So the cameras are uh, used to provide a uh, driver with the information which is typically gathered by the conventional uh, mirrors. This, is, this technology or this, uh, this uh, system is also heavily leveraging the uh, uh, imaging sensors. The typical block diagram of the front mono front camera uh, system is shown in this slide here. So it's, uh, uh, in this case, the, the system is uh, leveraging one high dynamic range uh, CMOS sensors, which is streaming the uh, video to uh, the system on the chip. External microcontrollers is used to communicate to vehicle CAN bus. And on this device uh, here, on this system on the chip, uh, we typically Typically, in, in the system, there are five or six concurrent uh, algorithms running. So there is a substantial uh, need for compute performance in, in this system here. Uh, while this system is positioned right behind the rear view mirror and exposed to direct sunlight, so the system needs to be uh, packaged in very small enclosure and must deliver maximum compute performance while dissipating minimum heat in order to, to, to operate in these extreme uh, temperatures. So these are all um, opposing requirements, and they uh, create a very challenging environment. On the top of that, there is also orthogonal requirement on functional safety, where these systems also have to comply to uh, at least ACL B a level of functional safety. Uh, so with this in mind, I'll, uh, I'll try to go over the, the, the key market trends that, that we see in ADA space. So we see a rapid expansion of the application and platforms. Uh, um, the features are moving from luxury cars to entry-line cars. Uh, legislation legislation uh, worldwide is also driving uh, widespreading of the projects. In, in Europe, we have a NCAP rating for the cars, five-star ratings for the cars. In, in US, uh, uh, starting from 2018, all cars manufactured uh, will have to be equipped with a, a rear uh, camera. There is more integration. The, the systems are getting smaller, and uh, the power uh, requirements are uh, also very uh, demanding. Uh, and there's also on the top of this uh, the safety uh, requirements. So the system needs to comply with the ACL 
uh, level size, so 26262. Uh, if we look at the, the typical uh, vision-based ADA system today, uh, the, all the processing can be all the processing can be uh, divided in, the, in in roughly three stages, overlapping stages. The 40 to 50 percent of the processing goes to low-level processing, which is characterized by repetitive operation at the pixel level. So uh, this type of processing is typically done best by uh, single instruction, multiple data uh, engine. Uh, the medium level of processing uh, it focuses on certain uh, regions of interest, uh, which are particularly interesting. And the mid-level vision is typically best served by using combination between SIMD and MIMD uh, uh, type of uh, processor. And at the high level, uh, which is consuming roughly 20 to 40 percent of the uh, processing, uh, we, uh, we see need to, for high-level processing where we fuse information from different modalities. We use temporal information uh, in the system to make a decision or to track objects uh, around the car. So with this in mind, it's really uh, uh, challenging to design the one device that will fit all these uh, requirements. So uh, Texas Instruments designed uh, a family of uh, SOCs to fit the uh, uh, requirements in, in the ADA space. And the three key major devices in this uh, family are TDA3, TDA2H, and TDA2S. These three devices are basically umbrella devices with uh, uh, several uh, derivatives un uh, under uh, this, this umbrella. So to, to achieve the hardware and software compa compatible products, uh, we built these SOCs from the same fabric. And the key IPs used to, to build these uh, uh, common fabric are shown here in this slide. So uh, we have the, the ISP, which is hardware accelerator to uh, convert raw input from the imager imager to, to YUV format. We have the IYHD, which is, uh, again, another hardware accelerator for video encode and decode. Uh, we have the, the GPU engine for uh, a viewing-based application to visualize 3D surround view to a, a driver. And compute cluster consists of uh, three cores, uh, Cortex-A15, uh, C6X DSP, and the, the EVE, embedded, Vive, uh, embedded Vision Engine. The EVE is specifically or targetly designed to address the uh, needs for embedded vision. Uh, how do we map these uh, different uh, uh, processing stages to these uh, compute cores? This uh, pyramid, processing pyramid, uh, is actually illustrating the, 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 the mapping between the uh, uh, low-level, mid-level, and high-level processing to these different uh, uh, cores. The low-level processing best fits on either on hardware accelerator or on embedded vision, embedded, uh, vision engine. Uh, the DSP is very good at mid- and high-level processing. And once we get outputs from Adaboost, uh, SVM, or CNN, we can uh, leverage the Cortex-A15 for high-level processing. Uh, uh, tasks. Uh, this slide here shows how we map the different SOCs in this ADAS fa family to different ADAS applications. So TDA3 device is covering uh, entry level to mid-end type of applications, and uh, uh, TDA2 is covering mid-level to high-level uh, performance uh, range. It's really uh, uh, impossible to cover uh, entry to high uh, performance within one application space with only one SOC. So in this way, we, uh, we split the, uh, the, the, the performance uh, span between the, the, the different members of the, of the SOC family. Uh, now uh, I'll try to give a little bit more detail uh, on the specifics for each of these devices in the, in, the, in the ADAS SOC family. This uh, block diagram here is high-level overview of the TDA2 uh, uh, device. Uh, the TDA2 device is targeted for mid to high uh, 
ADAS uh, systems. It, uh, it, it packs a 2.5 megabyte of uh, level three memory, which helps with the, uh, with the thermal aspects of ADAS, reducing the power dissipation. Uh, it also reduces the uh, latency, processing latency, keeping the, all the data, uh, as much memory, as much data as possible on, on chip. Uh, uh, we have uh, multiple uh, image, I mean video, video ports on this device, which, uh, which makes this uh, device suitable for surround view application, uh, surround view applications. There are two, on superset part, there are two 32-bit wide DDR interfaces that operate at 532 uh, megahertz. Uh, this device comes into two packages, 23 by 23 millimeter and 17 millimeter package, and uh, derivatives in each package are uh, pin uh, compatible. Uh, so for entry level to mid-level uh, use cases, we target TDA3 scalable family. Again, this is a superset device. Uh, which is built from the same fabric as the TDA2. Again, uh, same compute cores, uh, except Cortex-A15, you can see on this uh, uh, device. So uh, two dual DSPs, single EVE. Uh, on this device here, we uh, have a ISP, uh, and uh, there is a number of uh, functional safety features that are added on this device to support uh, uh, applications such as uh, front camera or, or, or rear, rear view camera. Uh, this device comes in two packages. One is 15 by 15 millimeter BGA package, and the second package is 12 by 12 millimeter package, which allows the pop. So on the pa pop package, we actually allow the memory to be mounted on the top of the, uh, on the, on the top of TDA3. So this is actually shown in this slide here. So uh, TI is leveraging 10 plus years of uh, uh, pop experience in mobile uh, uh, market, and we are taking this experience in automotive, and uh, TDA3 is the first automotive device uh, with, uh, with the pop technology, which is really important for applications such as rear view where the space is really uh, uh, essential. Uh, and the system needs to fit in uh, one inch cube. The uh, pop advantages are lower cost memory, so it gives the customers a way to negotiate uh, memory cost with the suppliers. It's a uh, it, it gives a multiple memory suppliers, so it, which mitigates the supply risk and uh, uh, supply continuity and, uh, and customer control. Uh, so this slide here gives our overview, so side by side compare between the TDA2 and TDA3, and I'm, um, I'll, I'll leave this uh, to you to go through this overview uh, at your uh, uh, leisure. So it just gives a side by side uh, uh, compare between these two devices. Uh, with this, we can go uh, in the use cases uh, and show how these SOCs fit in the uh, in the, in, the, in the real ADA system. So this uh, block diagram here shows the uh, Ethernet-based surround view built around the TDA2 device. So we have a satellite camera streaming the either motion JPEG or H.264 compressed video over Ethernet uh, to TDA2. TDA2 is uh, uh, taking this video, doing the photometric matching, uh, stitching, de-warping, uh, uh, it also has the GPU that can create a G 3D uh, view to a driver, and then the output is sent to a console or to a cluster. Uh, uh, this block diagram here shows the rear view camera. So as I, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the, block, uh, the, the rear view camera is really space constrained, where the system needs to fit within a one inch cube. So the memory, LPDDR2, and the Quad Spy uh, fit in a pod, pod package on the top of the uh, TDA3. So all of this uh, fits in a 12 by 12 millimeter uh, PCB footprint. The camera is streaming the video directly to the TDA3. We use the, uh, the ISP, on-chip ISP, to convert the raw video to uh, uh, YUV, and we can do um, some analytics on the top of the uh, uh, viewing functions that are required for 
rear view camera so we can detect the, obst uh, the, the obstacles, objects left in a, in a rear view or, 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 or uh, 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 people. Uh, this is, this uh, block diagram shows the uh, entry level surround you built around the TDA2, TDA3. Uh, the uh, remote cameras are streaming video uh, via FPD link, we are LVDS, uh, to a central location. This is the CSI hub, which is streaming the, this uh, video to TDA3. Uh, uh, you might notice that uh, in this slide here, we absorb the functionality of external MCU that is typically used to, to uh, talk to external CAN bus. So this functionality is absorbed on TDA3. And the reason why this might be possible is that uh, we instrumented a number of uh, functional safety uh, features in this TDA3 device uh, to, uh, to allow this type of functionality. So the functional safety is really uh, one of the uh, uh, key concern in, for driver assistance. And in TI, we uh, evolved from the quality managed devices like TDA1 to uh, TDA2, which is uh, designed to be used in uh, systems with ACLA rating, to the TDA3 device, which is from, designed from ground up uh, uh, with the ACLB uh, in mind. Um, so this uh, uh, slide here is a high-level overview of the, all the functional safety features we put on the TDA3. Um, uh, it will take a, a quite a bit of time to go over each of these uh, 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 balloons, or, 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 or over these details, so just highlight some. We actually instrumented a built-in self-test for logic and for memory on this device, so the, it's possible to run this uh, test online. We have uh, CRC, we have ECC protection on all the internal memories, uh, uh, ECC protection on external memory. Uh, there's an error signaling modul module on this device, and uh, clock compare, and so on. Uh, so the power dissipation on, in the ADAS is also very important, for, especially for front camera and uh, rear view camera. And uh, for rear view camera, uh, the power envelope that the SOC needs to meet because of the thermal constraint is roughly one watt. Uh, the TDA3 can meet these requirements, uh, uh, and this is the use case, typical use case for a TDA3 in rear view uh, uh, system. The, TDA3 in front camera, there's a little bit more uh, power, but uh, roughly in front camera, we see uh, power, power limitation of between two and three uh, watts. Surround so you and the front camera are more uh, uh, forgiving because the, uh, the surround view and, and fusion are more forgiving because the system is located in the, in the cabin. Uh, so this uh, slide here uh, gives a high-level overview of the uh, software package that comes with uh, our SOCs. So we uh, give the Vision SDK, which includes the DSP and Eve optimized libraries, starterware, which is OS agnostic. Uh, uh, we, we give the agnostic libraries. We also have the AutoSAR uh, MCAL uh, to run on the Cortex-M4 cores. Uh, on, on the family of the uh, these SOCs. Um, so the, uh, there are two flavors of uh, ADAS Vision SDK. One is the uh, Vision SDK, which is based on SysBIOS, and the second one is uh, based on the Linux. So typically, the use case for, uh, in use case for front camera or rear view or where the latency and performance is very critical, uh, this is the uh, version of uh, uh, Vision uh, SDK uh, that is typically uh, that is typically used. So with the with the package, we include some uh, uh, code examples. We include uh, some demos, but we are not included. We are not including a production worthy. Um, uh, code because in, in ADAS it takes uh, uh, millions of miles to harden the, the algorithms and uh, we are not in a we are not in the business of providing the, the algorithm code. So with this uh, in 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 mind, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we demonstrated that the the, the, the TDA two family 
TDA3 family gives uh, diverse compute requirements for various uh, uh, algorithms within an ADAS space, and that heterogeneous multi-core architecture like, like TDA2 and TDA3 uh, is a great platform to provide a scalable ADAS uh, system solution. So uh, uh, with this, uh, um, I, uh, I, I would be uh, happy to answer any questions that you might, you might have. Thanks, thanks for your attention. And for more, for more uh, details, you can go to uh, ti.com slash ADAS uh, in case uh, you want any more details. Thank you. Great talk. We can take questions from the left or the right. And as we have people, ah, we have one on the right. Uh, my, name, my name is Tadao Nakamura, Cool Chips Conference Series. Uh, could you show me the details of communication between um, heterogeneous cores? Probably, oh. yeah. So the communication between heterogeneous cores is done through uh, semaphores. So we have, uh, we have a set of semaphores that we use to communicate back and forth, and we also use the L3 memory, shared memory, to communicate uh, between the between the cores, so uh, all memory on the on the device is actually accessible to uh, to uh, to different cores. For example, the Eve embedded Eve engine doesn't have a data cache, so you could actually use the DMA to move the data to the internal memory of the the Eve. But internal communication between the cores is done through a through a, through semaphores and and spin locks. Okay, much appreciated. <clears throat> I had a quick question regarding the, these are safety systems that you're building. Is our, does TI provide any formal methods for checking the code or in, ensuring that these systems are safe that you build with the DSPs? So the final certification is up to a customer. We do provide the safety manuals. We do provide the FMEDA documents so the customer can take this and assess based on the way they use the device. They can assess what are the fit, what is the fit rate, what is the diagnostic coverage they can achieve. There's also I mean, so we we help uh, customers uh, with 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 these with these tasks. One final question: Can you give us an idea on the uh, future, where the pressure in this architecture is going? What what systems are going to grow more rapidly than others? Uh, so there are, there are some new emerging applications like a, a driver monitor, a camera uh, monitoring systems, so the, the digital mirrors. So these are emerging applications. And I think the, uh, the next the big step everybody is chasing is autonomous car. So I think driver monitor and all the, 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 the camera replacement with the, with the, I mean, mirror replacement with the cameras, those are the new emerging applications. So. Uh, fusion is another space, another another application. Fusing all these uh, modalities together and collecting radar, vision, leader at one place and deciding what's going. Maybe building a map around the vehicle. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, we're switching gears again, going to AMD. Uh, Guhan Krishnan is from AMD. He's a fellow there. Uh, he works on cores, SOCs, system engineering in general. He is the SOC architect for AMD's sixth generation APU, uh, codenamed Carrizo, and driving the project from definition to eventual proxization uh, this year. Prior to AMD, he was at TI and Sun. Uh, he has over 18 years of industry experience. Uh, he holds a uh, BE and a master's uh, and has uh, 12 US patents uh, in areas of processor cache, clocking, DRAM controllers, and power management. This, I'll hand it over to him. Thank you, John. In this presentation, we'll be talking about the energy efficiency improvements in AMD's next generation processor, codenamed Carrizo. Carrizo is AMD's sixth generation A series APU um, designed for notebook and convertible platforms. Um, Carrizo had one main design goal, um, to, um, to deliver um, generational performance and battery life improvement um, while remaining in the same cost-effective 28 nanometer design node as the previous generation SOC, Kaveri. 
this design goal um, really forced AMD to improve the energy efficiency of its IPs. And that's what we'll be talking about today. I'll quickly introduce the SOC and um, a deep dive into the energy efficiency features in graphics and multimedia and summarized um, with some results. All right, here's the SOC block diagram. Um, we have 12 compute cores, um, four x86 CPU cores um, that has been redesigned um, to be 23% smaller and about 40% lower power profile than its predecessors. We have eight graphics compute cores, which are tied together with the rest of the SOC with a fully cache coherent fabric. Um, we have several fixed function hardware accelerators. We have a new video decoder, which is capable of handling HEVC H.265 video. We have a video encoder. We have an audio coprocessor and a crypto offload uh, accelerator as well. We have a display engine, which is capable of supporting three independent displays. For IOs, we have 128 bits of DDR3, and we have 12 lanes of PCI Express Gen 3. For the first time in an A-series processor, we've integrated a south bridge to reduce system cost. Some die statistics. Um, the chip size is about 250 mm square. Um, we were able to integrate about 3.1 billion transistors in this APU. Um, that constitutes about 29% increase in density when compared to the previous 28 nanometer process Kaveri, excuse me, previous 28 nanometer uh, A-series APU Kaveri for a nominal 2% area increase. This density increase has allowed Carrizo to integrate new IPs like Southbridge and dedicate um, area for performance features in graphics and multimedia. We'll be looking at it. We'll be looking at these features in this presentation. This slide gives a general overview of um, AMD's graphics architecture. In Carrizo, we had eight graphics compute cores. We have a front end with eight asynchronous scheduling engines, which dispatch work to these compute cores. In the back end, we have a 512 L2 cache, um, a 512 kilobyte L2 cache. This configuration delivers about 819 gigaflops per second in compute throughput. The next set of slides, we're going to talk about the energy efficiency improvements in this graphics architecture. These improvements are designed to increase the frames per second rendered on graphics applications on a thermally constrained power envelope. Well, the thermal design powers for notebook SOCs in notebook platforms range from about 15 watts to 35 watts, with a typical power budget being 15 watts. Carrizo is optimized to this 15 watt operating point. The first energy efficiency feature we'd like to share with you is called Graphics Voltage Islands. For the first time in Carrizo, we've moved the graphics engine into a separate dedicated voltage plane. This actually allows Carrizo SOC to control the power dissipated in the graphics engine by independently controlling the voltage and frequency of the graphics engine um, based on the graphics activity and not by any other SOC IP components. This is shown in the slide, next slide. If you see the graph in the top, you can see a significant steady state voltage difference between the SOC operating point and the graphics operating point um, during PC gaming. This steady state voltage difference can translate to a significant power constraint frequency loss if we implemented Carrizo with a combined SOC and graphics voltage plane. This graph in the bottom shows the frequency delta or frequency loss if we had implemented it that way. Another use case which um, takes advantage of graphics voltage islands is intensive multimedia applications like 4K video playback, which needs a high SOC voltage for high fixed function clocks. There's the same problem here where, um, the, where the um, graphics, uh, graphics power dissipated, if you implemented a Carrizo with a combined um, graphics voltage plane, would be thermally unsustainable um, for a 15 watt notebook platform. Um, Graphics Voltage Islands finally augments power gating um, for idle and use, uh, battery use cases by completely shutting off the voltage for graphics engine at the voltage regulator. The next slide shows this implementation of the graphics island. Um, we wake up the um, voltage plane when there's a doorbell write from the CPU to the graphics engine indicating there's work to be done. This is the blue path. 
And we shut down uh, this graphics voltage plane when there's extended periods of idle activity in the graphics core. The wake up and shutdown events are controlled by the firmware running on the system management processor. And the voltage crossing hardware which we've added to this design um, contributes to less than 0.1% of the design of, of the chip area, I'm sorry. The next um, energy efficiency feature we'd like to showcase is color compression. Color compression reduces the DRAM bandwidth required for graphics render. And the reason we chose color compression is because 40% of, um, of the DRAM traffic for typical PC games ends up being from color buffer. So we implemented a color compression scheme um, which compresses the color when the color ca cache is flushed by the uh, graphics engine. And we uncompress this color uh, data structure when the graphics pipeline rereads the color back from system memory. This is lossless color compression. And um, it's done in a way which is transparent to software. And lab results show that we get an average of 5 to 7% um, uh, frames per second improvement in typical PC games. All right, the next, um, the next energy efficiency feature we're going to showcase is um, low power um, implementation of the graphics core. The uh, graph over here shows the typical um, power budget of um, the graphics core in a notebook platform. It ranges from 5 watts to 25 watts. Um, the goal of low power physical implementation then is to um, enable the maximum number of cores um, in the 5 watt operating point or the vmin point and then deliver the maximum power constraint frequency for the power ranges of 5 to 25 watts. We achieved this increase, though, by significantly reducing the uh, leakage of the 28 nanometer device library. We reduced the leakage by 2.5x compared to Kaveri and gave up about 10% of drive strength. This is shown in the universal curve, which plots the um, total um, I on current, or the on current versus the off current for both the 28 nanometer libraries. The trees are shown in blue, Kaveri is shown in um, orange, you can see that significant portion of the Carrizo um, graphics core has been implemented by a significantly lower leakage high VT device. And this net leakage reduction um, in that um, high VT device has allowed Carrizo to use faster um, VT devices for the design critical paths. Well, what does this achieve us? This technique allowed us to enable the maximum number of compute cores for the 15 watt SOC. And it turns out that we could enable all eight graphics cores. And um, that is a 33% improvement than what we did in Kaveri. This technique also allowed us to increase power constraint frequency by 10% over Kaveri. Next, we see the graphics power gating. We have several graphics power gating regions in Carrizo's graphics com um, core. Each of the graphics compute cores can be individually power gated. So can the 3D graphics pipe. Graphics power gating is controlled by the microprocessor, uh, sorry, a microcontroller, which is an always on domain. The microcontroller um, monitors the activity, um, wavefront activity in each of the power gating regions. And um, with a network of what we call block power monitors. And it uh, does the up down decision of power gating based on, uh, in conjunction with the firmware running in the um, system management controller. And typically, um, we tend to uh, enable all eight graphics cores um, unless there's an infrastructure or thermal um, limit, which is getting violated. Here we see um, the power gating flow where the graphics engine um, transitions from a fully idle state to uh, a fully power gated state and comes back to a fully active state. You can see that before we go into coarse grain power gating or CGPG, uh, we enter a clock gated state uh, where all the clocks are gated for the graphics core. The state machine on the left shows this transition and shows a couple of other things. Um, we support um, fully power gating just the compute cores, fully power gating just the 3D graphics pipe, and also uh, power gating both the graphics pipe and the um, uh, compute cores. Next, we see energy efficient clocking in Carrizo. We have a single VCO which talks to multiple DFS, or digital frequency synthesizer blocks, which generate clock for the multimedia and graphics IP. 
Um, each of these um, DFS clocks can be independently controlled by software. The DFS clocks can be clock gated at the root. Um, and we can disable the VCO and bypass it with low fixed frequency clock for certain um, uh, battery use cases like Windows Idle. Graphics clock is distributed with a custom tree. We have five horizontal, vertical, five horizontal trees and one vertical tree um, supplying the graphics clock to a clock mesh. Um, the clock mesh has coarse and medium grain clock gating with the fine grain clock gating in each of the tiles. We also do um, dynamic, power, uh, dynamic clock gating based on load balancing. For the first time in Creezo, we implemented adaptive clocking um, in the graphics core. This means that um, with a droop detector and a clock stretcher, we can actually stretch the clock dynamically when we see a droop event in the uh, graphics plane. Previous generation SOCs, we statically over-voltage the pa part, assuming a worst case um, droop event all the time. All right. Um, the next thing we see is graphics power performance management. We have eight discrete performance states, or DPM states, in Carrizo. These are chosen to, um, uh, to operate in the range of Vmin to Vmax. Um, and they're optimized for low, high, and medium state, uh, medium CAC graphics applications. We have an algorithm which runs in the system management processor, which controls the up-down decisions of this DPM based on activity thresholds which are programmed into each of these DPMs. So by default, we uh, tend to go to the highest DPM um, when there's graphics activity. And then we um, tend to waterfall down um, uh, based on thresholds and the overall chip um, power budgets. Um, obviously, during um, battery mode, we cannot be this aggressive. And we have uh, some response filtering to make sure that um, we are not this aggressive. All right, putting it all together, um, all these power management features and energy efficiency features we have talked about till now um, actually work together and deliver about 65% performance uplift on the 15 watt part um, against the previous generation SOC, Kaveri. Um, we get 23% from the two additional CUs which we enabled. We get about 30% of power constraint frequency and about 8%, sorry, 12% from the other energy efficiency features we talked about. While we have optimized for the 15-watt SOC, we still get a nice juicy uplift in the 35-watt um, part as well. Next, we see the statistics of the battery use case. Um, we have high 90s power gating and, uh, and low clock DPM residencies across all um, battery use cases, from idle to Windows, um, Windows idle to video playback to YouTube, um, web browsing, and office productivity. All right, um, let's move on to the video IP. To facilitate a differentiating video viewing and video manipulating experience in Carrizo, we decided to um, invest a significant more amount of area um, for um, video IP in Carrizo than Kaveri. In this video, in this area, we have a new video uh, decoder which, can, which is capable of handling HEVC, H.265 video decoding in hardware and decoding 4K H.264 video at vMin. It's really important. We do it at vMin. When we com combine this video decoder with a dual video compression engine, what we ended up is we got a 350% increase in 1080p transcode performance. That's incredible. And at the same time, we added some uh, low-power video features, um, which can actually reduce 1080p video playback. We, I, I'll show it to you in the next set of slides. Quickly going through the video decoder architecture, um, we have two parallel video decode paths, a legacy video decoder and a brand new redesigned high-performance H.264 and a HEVC H.265 decoder. We have a microcontroller, which um, is dispatching video jobs to these decode paths. And we have a video cache, which is um, meant to store um, macro, video macro data. The goal of this architecture is to do two things, to speed up 1080p video decode. We do this by the fact that the new H.264 um, H.265 decoder can support 4K video decode at vMin. The other thing is to offload HEVC H.265 video decode away from the CPU 
lab results show that this actually reduces the SOC power profile by almost 2x. Quickly going through the video encoder architecture, it's very similar to the video decoder engine. Um, all we do in Creezo is double up the number of video compression engines. Um, this is the catalyst along with the increased throughput of decode in the video decoder um, um, is the reason why we have 350% of um, transcoding performance uplift. Let's shift gear away from video transcoding and look at low power features. Um, to counteract the growth of the video decoder, because um, we supported HEVC H265 handling in the video decoder, we introduced dynamic UVD power gating. In the previous generation SOC Kaveri, um, the UVD would always be on um, when the video is active. In Creezo, we dynamically power gate the uh, VD, UVD, or universal video decoder, um, between frames. When we combine this with a cooler 28 nanometer technology, and the fact that the video decoder can actually decode 1080p um, three times faster now, um, what ends up is the net leakage of the video decoder ends up being three times smaller than what it was in Kaveri. Okay. Here we show um, the management of video dynamic power. Um, we have, um, uh, we, uh, we track the idle and decode, idle and decode times um, uh, in the microcontroller. And if we see a trend of um, increasing um, uh, decode times, then we increase the video clock. And if we see a longer trend of uh, decreasing, increasing idle times, uh, we decrease the um, de uh, video, video decoder clock. This way, um, we are tracking, um, the video decoder clock is tracking the video activity in the chip. All right, this is a very important feature. This is another technique um, to reduce the uh, video playback power, and it uses OS hook. If the OS can support uh, independent video hardware plane that is capable of um, video plane for hardware to process video efficiently, what we can do is eliminate the graphics post-processing power and the energy it takes to transfer video data from the DRAM to graphics and back to DRAM. This is shown in the uh, picture on the bottom. Uh, in Creezo, we have some uh, video processing IP in the display engine, which can directly read the video output from the video decoder from memory. This is shown in this slide. It's a pretty much of an eye chart, but um, the takeaway is we have a dedicated video plane um, is in the uh, display engine, which reads YUV data directly from memory, and we can blend the output into any of the existing graphics planes um, before it goes out to the external display. This actually saved 20% of video playback power. Um, the charts on the top and bottom shows the power saved in the graphics plane, graphics actually, uh, graphics post-processing, and the power saved um, by the saved DRAM bandwidth. All right, let's talk about um, how quickly we can transition um, a, ch a chip from doing something um, active um, to a completely idle state. There are two pictures in this slide. Uh, the picture on the left shows uh, Creezo IPs fully active, and the pictures on the right shows Creezo pictures fully power gated and DRAM in self refresh. It turns out that longer we spend time in self refresh, the lower the power profile of the SOC and the system is. And this is shown in this uh, next slide. It's again an eye chart, but I'll let me talk through it. Um, what it tells you is as we reduce the average self refresh time, um, we increase um, a power of any system app, any battery use case. And what we have done is all the low power features we've seen till now in Creezo adds up and increases the average self-refresh self residency in Creezo. The, slide in the, uh, the graph in the bottom shows um, Windows idle improving by almost 5%, I'm sorry, 6%, and 1080p uh, increased by almost 40% and office productivity suites improved by 10%. All right, this is a pretty important um, uh, uh, feature in Creezo. Um, the uh, picture on the top shows a Kaveri, discrete, a Kaveri platform with a discrete south bridge. In Creezo, we integrated the south bridge um, into the SOC, 
And by doing so, we eliminated a by four Gen 2 PCI link, and we were able to reduce the core voltage of the analog and the digital uh, part of the South Bridge. And we were able to power gate the South Bridge. And as with almost all integration, um, when we integrate a discrete chip into the SOC, um, uh, we get an order of magnitude uh, power reduction in that IP. And that's what is shown in the, um, um, in the graph below. We get about 6x reduction in Windows Idle and about 4x reduction in uh, 1080p video playback. All right, time to summarize. Um, we've looked at energy efficiency features, which gave us about 65% of um, uh, performance, graphics performance uplift. We looked at um, the uh, video architecture, which gave us 350% improvement in 1080p video transcode. The low power architecture features um, delivers us this um, uh, dramatic battery life gain. We get, because of all the low power features and integrating the South Bridge, we have about 40% reduction in Windows Idle and 50% reduction in um, HD video playback. What this means is you get the performance when you need it, and you still enjoy uh, all-day battery um, experience with Carrizo. Finally, um, you, you've seen all the architecture and implementation tricks we've done um, to give this compelling performance and um, battery life and remain in uh, cost-effective 28 nanometer technology. Early last year, um, AMD started an initiative called 2520. Um, which uh, had a vision of increasing the energy efficiency of AMD processors by 25x by end of 2020. And Creezo is well on its way, and the first chip um, um, to um, uh, get to this, first uh, chip to, um, in this initiative to deliver much better performance for a much lower typical energy use. Thank you, guys. Actually finished. We'll open up for, uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, while we wait for people to get to the uh, mics, I'm going to start with the obvious question. Can you give us a comparison in terms of this product and uh, Intel's uh, similar? All right. Um, it's actually, um, it actually uh, compares pretty favorably to Intel Core i5. Um, it's a mixed bag. Um, we continue our, um, uh, our superiority in graphics performance. And um, system benchmarks like PCMark, where, which uh, um, evaluates the whole system performance, we are neck and neck. Um, for battery life, uh, we are ahead in Windows Idle, uh, and they are ahead in uh, productivity and video playback. So it's a mixed bag, and that's a fair answer to give. We'll start with on the left. Yeah, uh, Bill Rash, uh, Intel. My question is uh, regarding the uh, power gating of the GPU. You showed a, a phase where the GPU registers are saved yes. during the process. And mm -hmm. so my question is, well, where are the GPU registers saved? And give me a sense for the amount of time involved to do both the save and then a subsequent restore of the GPU. Excellent question. Um, it's saved in a carved out space in DRAM, uh, which is not accessible to anybody else. And the times which it takes is probably proprietary, and I can't go into it. Sorry. OK. Uh, I can give you a sense of the numbers um, on the side. OK. On the right. Non -quark, uh, Qualcomm, two questions. First question is, did you modulate your DDR frequency based on the workload? That's yes, we do. OK. The other, what, what is the granularity? Um, we can choose two DDR frequencies out of four memory P states. And how often do you do the modulation? It depends on the um, use case. Okay. And whether you're in uh, um, battery mode or in, um, plugged into the uh, wall jack. Okay. The second question, you raised to uh, cell refresh? So yes, Is that done by the, uh, the dedicated microcontroller, or is, is how is they machine based? Um, the whole point of, in, I mean, it's a whole bunch of interaction of several features, right? Um, uh, we have, um, uh, we need to... It goes into power gating times. It goes into um, the size of the uh, buffers and display so that it can drive the display um, uh, panel. Um, so it, it is a really complicated question. I can probably take it offline and talk to you in deep. I'd be happy to uh, share that information. OK, thanks. A question on my left. Yeah, Michael Deering, uh, Where LD. 
Um, it sounds like uh, one of the things you did with the uh, video uh, output is add some more features so you could bypass having to use the GPU That's right. part of the video output. Okay, the problem is there are more and more applications that are depending upon GPU functionality you, you right. in order to be able to uh, uh, get things out, and if you bypass that, so if you're right, you're right. Um, so there, are, for most cases, like common use cases, like full screen video playback, or some scaled video playback, we can use this scheme which we use. So for instance, if you are in a um, cross country flight um, and you are watching a DVD and you're in a full screen video situation, so you, then you can bypass the uh, graphics and benefit from the uh, low power situation which we talked about. But not, not if you, not if you're using a device for that playback uh, that optically depends upon the GPU for corrections? If you use, if you use Windows uh, Media Player in Windows 8.1 in full screen mode, we've shown that we can uh, bypass the GPU. Okay. Question on my right. Mike Filippo from ARM. You described a 29% increase in uh, implementation density. Um, could I you repeat that? Yeah, you described a 29% increase in implementation yeah. density utilization. I'm curious if that came from library, general, general uh, improvement of implementation, and if there was a frequency hit. All of the above. Um, uh, we significantly um, went with a high-density library um, with a different metal stack. Um, a smaller standard cell library gave up some frequency um, for the area increase. What was the frequency hit, if you can? Um, um, well, um, non-zero, that's okay. Non-zero, yep. <laughs> Sounds like a personal conversation to have. Again on the right. Nathan Brookwood, Insight 64. You mentioned that uh, the power gating was controlled by firmware uh, based on thermal conditions. That's right. And I'm wondering, is, are those thermal conditions actually being measured on the chip or are these based on calculated uh, values. Both of the above. Um, we have um, um, temperature sensors which we, uh, which we measure actual temperature, and we have um, thermal RC constants which are used to calculate temperature as well. So if, somebody, if an OEM has a, a weak thermal implementation, this will cut things off quickly. That's right. And Great. that's the infrastructure limit which I was talking about. Okay, thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you all. Thanks, man. Good job. All right, next we're changing gears completely, going to massively parallel processor arrays from CalArray. Our next speaker is Benoit de Deschamps from uh, CalArray. And let me get my screen. Um, Benoit has an engineering undergrad in radar and telecommunications, as well as a PhD. Uh, he spent time with Cray, uh, doing some of the software pipelining uh, for both the T3E, for those who remember what that is, and the F-Series, uh, also looking at implementing some of the first PGAS language uh, and Co-Array Fortran uh, language support. Uh, from there, he went to ST uh, Micro, both in France and Switzerland. Uh, where he became a fellow, and in 2009 he uh, joined CalArray, uh, worked on heading up the software uh, components of that system, as well as taking over the architecture of their VLIW core. And with that, I will let him talk to you about their MPPA. Okay, so I'm uh, going to describe uh, the. Um Massively Parallel Array, which is a, a processor manufactured by Carray. And so uh, what I'm uh, describing today is, a, uh, in fact, the second uh, instance of this processor. So we had the first generation that uh, was uh, uh, produced at the uh, beginning of uh, 2013. And uh, we've been living with this uh, A generation called ND. Uh, for almost two years, and uh, we've been uh, taping out the B generation, the Boston, uh, in April this year, 
and we got the chip back from TSMC Fab uh, in uh, early June this year, and it's still in the bring-up phase, but uh, so far so good. So uh, we use the uh, TSMC 28 nanometer HP. Uh, we didn't move to uh, HPM, for instance, because uh, uh, we kept the same uh, analog IPs. But nevertheless, with the same technology node, we did quite a dramatic improvement in the uh, overall uh, performance indicators. Uh, first on the raw performance, on the clock rate, but you have the clock rate, but also the architecture improvement, and you have the energy efficiency, and I will uh, go with that uh, uh, in this presentation. So this is uh, the explanation of a, a Boston processor uh, generation B uh, from Carray. And work is already uh, underway to define uh, and to evolve the architecture into the generation C. And here we'll have to decide whether we go to smaller number, of course, in order to be more in deeply embedded function, or we move to same or higher number of cores uh, in case uh, we move more into a cloud and data center acceleration. So um, if we look at uh, accelerators and uh, specialized processors that uh, you can actually program, uh, let's say you have the FPGAs that you program with uh, hardware languages. You have uh, DSP, GPU, and uh, many cores, like uh, especially the Intel Mic. But you can see there is quite a, a, a range of properties. If you go from FPGA to DSP to GPU to Mic, it's a more and more uh, programmable in a general way. But uh, on the other hand, you lose uh, uh, things like perhaps energy efficiency, but more importantly for uh, the market and the application we target, uh, the uh, time uh, critical uh, abilities. In fact, we're interested whether our computation can be done in a time you can qualify, you can reproduce, you can guarantee, you can even certify. And when, when you have this new constraint in mind, let's say you want to do a control system, you want to uh, do a robotics, you want to do cyber physicals, basically you start with the defense and aerospace application. Well, it's very difficult to have uh, evolved a computing machine to also be fit for time critical. And uh, looking at this range of uh, technology for uh, auxiliary processors and accelerators, uh, we say, well, perhaps, uh, FPGA, uh, too, too difficult to program uh, for, for many people. And uh, we want to be time critical. So in fact, uh, GPU today do, do not uh, enable this. So let's have a look at uh, DSP technology. Even though DSP, it has uh, it's an ancient technology, it has uh, quite a number of shortcomings. And so uh, what we call time critical computing here, the definition is that you compute and you have timing constraint uh, associated with uh, different parts of your information manipulation, your acquisition, processing, transport, storage, coordination, delivery. And what you want in those kind of applications is that you want determinism first. You run the system again and again. If you have the same input, same correlation of timing, then you get the same uh, output. You want predictability. You want to be able to overall understand what will be the system response when, when you uh, plan for it. And more importantly, you want composability. I have different functions, and I aggregate them, and especially important when you have a, a multi-core, many-core, because you, you want to reduce the swap and, and, and put all your functions together. So you need composability. And uh, in uh, the most uh, demanding uh, class of application, you want to certify that the application will respond. And this goes to a certification process, be it uh, avionics, be it uh, automotive, be it uh, uh, energy, transport. And uh, today, uh, when you go to uh, certify for uh, time criticality, this is done, especially uh, in a flight control of a main aircraft. You do it by static analysis of the code, and it will answer this piece of binary code I certify with a certified tool that the worst case will be that. And now you have a problem of knowing how good your architecture can be, not only at actual performance, actual power consumption, but the, the mismatch between what the tool for certification tells what will be uh, the worst case and what is the reality. If you can reduce this gap, 
In fact, you win. What we observe is that with architecture, the gap is, say, 3x uh, on flight control system, for instance, and you take a general CPU, you will have uh, 20x, 50x, and, and, and so forth. So this is, uh, in fact, the particular set of constraints of time-critical computing. Now, it's difficult to be fit for time-critical computing already at the core level, uh, because uh, when you have a, a speculation, branch prediction, out-of-order execution, in fact, the core itself is not very predictable and, and even deterministic with uh, regard to response. And uh, now, when you go to multi-core, you start to have a second problem. The different cores will interact, and, and, and they will compete upon shared resources. And those resources can be hardware resources, and you also have uh, software effects like amplification of timing difference be between of the, the order of taking locks, or for instance, you have uh, uh, exception processing and you have turbulence in, in cage that will just uh, disrupt your computation of response time. But in fact, what we do at CalRay is that we look at those constraints and we believe we can do a, a good job uh, to answer those uh, requirements. And those uh, requirements apply in particular in the field we are looking at, and we have uh, quite uh, good uh, early results. Aerospace defense, autonomous vehicles, financial trading platform, large physical instrumentation. Let's say we work in particular with the square kilometer array uh, central signal processing part, where you have stream of data and a gigabyte of data from a radio telescope. You don't, don't lose any. And of course, also, you have uh, robotics and uh, other kind of application. So how uh, can we address this kind of uh, uh, application? And, uh, and what is our, our view on this? Uh, we, selected by, by, we started by selecting the DSP style of acceleration, because it's software programmable, and it has the uh, timing properties that uh, uh, provides a good foundation. It's also programmable by software to some extent. And then on top of this, we want some things we can easily program. And so we, uh, we use the standard tools. We want 32-bit, but also 64-bit addresses, like on a CPU, not like 32-bit uh, always, like on a MCU. We want real operating systems. And we want to integrate all those many cores onto a single chip. And we also want the I.O. We don't want some, some, someone else to, to deal with the I.O. because the I.O., the jitter, the I.O. latency is part of the timing uh, response equation. And, and, and finally, we want the, uh, the whole thing to scale. So uh, this is the overview of the architecture. It's based on, on, on the three, uh, three level of granularity, uh, plus uh, uh, an extra thing, which is a net network on chip. So the first uh, part is that we uh, design a single VLIW core, and this core is meant to behave as an application core and, or, and also as an MCU core. And uh, we, we have uh, here a summary of features that I will uh, describe a little bit uh, later. Then we take 16 plus one of such cores, we put them in small uh, multi-core multi processors that we call compute cluster. So we have a static memory, we have 16 application core, a 17th core, and then auxiliary burst master, and this becomes a compute tile we call a compute cluster. Then those compute cluster, we put 16 on them on the uh, many core processor. And in addition to those 16 compute cluster, uh, each of them having a 16 core plus one uh, management cores, we have two blocks of I.O. Uh, clusters and those IO clusters that are connected to a DDR controller, Ethernet, PCIe, and they are powered by two quad cores. And those quad cores they implement exactly the same architecture as all the compute cluster core because we figure that it's complex enough to have a multi core or many core. So let's try to have a single ISA for, for the world programming. And um, the way we came to this decision, in fact, is uh, interesting. We started with a machine. Uh, designed to be programmed with static data flow la language, uh, reminiscent, for instance, from uh, Streamit. But then it evolved because uh, we met with the uh, aerospace and defense community, and especially with a team uh, at the University of, of, of Salon in Germany, and the company who manufactures the static analysis timing tools for the flight control system in, of Airbus, of Sukhoi, of, uh, of several uh, other planes. 
And, and uh, this company is backed by, by uh, a group of scientists. They analyze what are the timing problems of course, they classify them, and they define a series of, uh, of categories and how you deal with at the microarchitecture level with the timing effects. And in fact, there is a strong uh, property of a particular core, which is called fully timing compositional. You take a bunch of software, if you can have the global worst case response time by combining the local worst case case, it's because uh, you can use it only if your core is fully timing compositional. This is a macro architecture and implementation of core property. You also have to do something with the cache. Only the LRU uh, cache policy can be precisely anal analyzed by this static analysis tool uh, used for aircraft uh, uh, flight control system certification. So we do the job at the cluster, uh, at the core level, then at the compute cluster level where we have a, a memory subsystem which is designed for minimizing the conflicts. At the processor level, we combine the computation by an, a network on chip which has a guaranteed service on the minimum bandwidth and the maximum latency of data transfers. So this is the uh, VLIW uh, core data pass. We started from VLIW because for it is good for uh, uh, the real estate of silicon, and it turns out that it's very good uh, base for uh, 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 stable timing properties. And uh, we did uh, uh, from scratch uh, the VLIW with the following ideas. We'll do five issues. We'll have uh, an ancient uh, uh, thing called the polycyclic property, meaning that if you have all your instruction of your loop, you pipe them as, pos as, uh, as tightly as possible, then this is how you, you get your software pipeline kernel in general. But this packing operation of a bunch of instructions that may use different resources into a minimal set of instruction bundle, it can be a very complicated problem, but it can be also a simple problem. And this is the gist of the polycyclic property uh, uh, described by Bob Rue in the 81 paper. Then the other idea of this score is that we must have, if possible, uh, uh, a unified register uh, space. We don't want floating point register, predicate register, address register, uh, data register like uh, in, in DSP. And, uh, so, uh, and um, also we uh, deal with the uh, various uh, uh, data widths by having uh, pairs uh, for 64 bit and otherwise we have uh, uh, 32 bit. And, and you see that uh, we have a kind of a clean and, and simple uh, uh, data pass, and it's an uh, eight-stage uh, uh, instruction pipeline. In fact, uh, the uh, principle and the foundation for, for this uh, VLIW, they come from the LX architecture uh, defined by uh, Josh Fisher, uh, Farah Boski, uh, Homewood, and Desoli in the ISCA uh, two, 2000 paper. And this LX uh, VLIW was, uh, in fact, uh, like a quad DLX uh, pipelines put in a VLIW form. It was very elegant, very simple VLIW. I work on the compiler and on the architecture evolution of this uh, product version of LX, which was the ST200 VLIW manufactured by ST Microelectronics. So when coming uh, to, um, uh, to Carre and we had to design the VLIW, we say it's such a great, simple and efficient uh, VLIW machine but it has shortcomings. In fact, we just went through the list of per perceived shortcomings of the LX architecture of Fisher, and then we, we changed things, and that's how we got our, our VLIW of today. Basically, uh, we uh, removed the uh, uh, sim simplistic feature of DLX, and we, uh, uh, we reworked the if conversion. Uh, one thing which is inefficient in, in predicated architecture, which is fairly fully predicated or, or, or partially predicated is to compute Boolean register over and over and over. It's better to do like in ARM. You have a 32-bit register or 64-bit, and on the fly, you apply a condition which is Im implied comparison with zero, and you get your predicate on the fly. And so it's very simple and cleaner, and you reduce, in fact, the noise and, and the loss of performance in your predicated uh, code sequence. And also, we, we put uh, hardware loops. So this is for the core, how, how we make uh, the uh, uh, cluster memory architecture fit for uh, time-critical computing. In fact, we have a multi-bank parallel memory system, and there was a dilemma. We want throughput, like in the local memory of GPU, 
or, or a, a central memory of a query machine, just use uh, address interleaving across, let's say, 16 memory banks. You want non-interference between uh, the different cores provided. They work at different uh, part of the address space at a given point of time. Uh, have a block of memory. Have a, uh, a bank, bank or block memory addressing. So in fact, we have a, a software configuration which has no functional effects but has the timing effect because it's a re, uh, uh, it changed the address mapping. But it's still a shared memory space uh, for all the cores connected uh, to, to this uh, memory in the uh, compute cluster. Now, the, the key part, you have the uh, cores, you have uh, the compute cluster. Now, how you get uh, decent timing properties and decent performance and low power uh, at the chip level. And we do this by using a network on chip. And this network on chip is, uh, in fact, a scaled on version of a macro network. So it's a RDMA capable. It's not doing load store, but it's not restricted to send receive. It does remote read, remote write, and plus uh, auxiliary signals that you can associate. And uh, in order to get any uh, guaranteed service on, on this kind of network, uh, we uh, just reuse or rediscovered a widely applied technique in avionics networks. If you know your routes, if you know the injection parameter of your traffic, that is the burstiness and the average rate, then you propagate equation and you know exactly what will be uh, the response time, uh, sorry, the uh, latency, the throughput, and you can also guarantee there will be no deadlock and no buffer overflow. And that's what we apply. We apply a very well-known technique used in the IFDX, that is the avionics Ethernet standard, uh, uh, very similar at the network on chip level. Now uh, we come to the question of doing I.O. If you look at recent FPGA and the evolution of FPGA, when you want to do a high performance, low latency I.O., uh, you have a, a different solution. You can uh, use, for instance, uh, several rapid I.O. But what, what we understand is that uh, Ethernet and, and uh, a level two Ethernet and a variant of Ethernet like uh, Rocky Ethernet are becoming a, a, a convenient way to uh, put uh, stream data in and out of a chip. And so uh, we spent quite uh, uh, work uh, at the architecture level to, uh, to merge the uh, Ethernet termination into the network on chip. And it's not uh, that easy because Ethernet has big frame, network on chip must have small packet in order to be fluid enough so you have a decent uh, uh, quality of, of service. So the, uh, I will not describe more the details, but. Basically, uh, we can uh, uh, put the, have the, the frame coming. Uh, we decide to, to balance them across the cluster and the core, and then they are distributed uh, onto the network on chip that itself implements the ring buffer structure you typically need in an in Ethernet Mac. Now I move uh, to the uh, software support. Software support. We have the local view of the compute cluster and the I.O. cluster, and here you are like in a, a scaled-down uh, uh, multi-core. So you, we have GCC, debugger, uh, uh, profiler, uh, system trace, operating systems that apply as a compute cluster. And then we have to stitch all those compute cluster computation together, and then we have a range of programming model from low level to mid-level to a higher level if we want. Higher level high level being, in our case, the OpenCL. So this is a, a view of the uh, software stack. We have a, a, a platform. We have the low-level programming interface of the low-level programming model. On top of this, we have either Linux on the I.O. Uh, uh, cluster or an Arthur's on the compute cluster. Then we have OpenMP from GCC or the POSIX thread. And then we have the GCC uh, compiler on one hand and the OpenCLC based on LLVM on the other hand when it comes to uh, OpenCL. And then on top of this, it's um, application dependent how you communicate uh, between cluster or between processors. Uh, you have different standards, for instance, in uh, ADAS and, uh, and uh, autonomous cars that we are looking at, they use a ROS uh, robotic operating system uh, API. So the low-level programming environment, uh, I will describe briefly, which is the foundation of everything, is interesting uh, on two counts. Uh, first, uh, it's how you get the most performance and predictability. And number two, that's the, the layer we expose, but it's higher than bare metal, and we expose this to the uh, third-party provider 
of tools and operating system because in a high uh, integrity application, uh, we do not provide Linux or Autos or whatever. Uh, the application comes with their own, own uh, software stack uh, certified for, uh, or certifiable for the uh, application class. But what is interesting here is that we have an exokernel class of hypervisor, which is a very thin uh, uh, operating system concept based on the idea that you should separate re, uh, hardware resource protection from uh, hardware resource management and the abstraction by the operating system. On top of this, we have the BSP. Then we have a library for dealing with the NOC, the root, and the power. And on top of this, we have uh, the driver for Ethernet PCI. We have a module to compute and to manage the quality of service by solving the equation of the network on chip. And interestingly, we have a software DSM system uh, reminiscent of the trademark system. And we do this because architecturally, uh, this is uh, seen here, each box, in fact, is a different uh, address space today. That's how we guarantee the lack of interference between the different cores. So we don't have flat 288 cores. We have uh, uh, 18 different address space. But when you go to, uh, let's say, POSIX uh, and OpenMP or OpenCL, you want the global memory space. And this is, in fact, emulated thanks to the software uh, sorry, software DSM uh, uh, support here. So this is a just a summary of what we do. We provide SMP Linux on the IO tile uh, and the, uh, a small uh, uh, POSIX-like operating system on the compute cluster, but we have third party uh, uh, putting the software, and especially uh, on the automotive in Japan, we have the ESOL company uh, putting their, their uh, EM cost uh, multi-core operating system on our chip. We also have open source effort, uh, like the Eric Enterprise uh, automotive uh, uh, ported to our, our system. So, in fact, uh, this uh, chip is quite uh, open with regard to the possible thing you can do uh, with it. And there are two directions, and we are kind of uh, uh, balancing which one should be get the most uh, focus. We can do uh, data center acceleration, and in that case, uh, the processor is seen mostly as a, a bunch of compute cluster with attached DDR memory, and you can look at it as a, let's say, a compute unit from the OpenCL point of view, or a bunch of DSP cores with a, a domain-specific API to offload, like uh, you do DPDK, or you do open data plane, or you, you go into a, a, a uh, advanced storage controllers. When you go to high performance embedded computing, the machine is seen in a different way. Here, the compute cluster becomes, in fact, the multi-core you want to deal with, and then it becomes the, the principal uh, uh, location of your application part, like uh, you, you use uh, your OpenCV uh, in, in, inside, and then you have to connect uh, with the IPC. And in this HPC class of application, uh, the compute cluster uh, uh, has the, uh, it appears as the uh, multi-core, but with the precision time uh, characteristic uh, we, we want to maintain, uh, which creates the value of a product. Um, this is uh, how we uh, uh, propose a product uh, for data center and cloud acceleration. So on top, we have your, your existing uh, uh, acceleration board, it's a PCI board for the previous generation of chip, and the Z1 below is the one uh, that will uh, come uh, 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 this fall with the new chip. And I will finish with that slide. Uh, this is a, an ancient slide. Uh, it was in comparison between the previous chip and the NVIDIA uh, Quadro 4000 on a defense uh, computer vision tracking object in an image. And we had quite a good improvement. But after we did this, the uh, customer said, uh, fine, we are convinced, but now make this implementation real-time capable. And something we don't understand how a GPU could do it, and for us, it's a quite a, a lot of work to do yet in order to, to, to fulfill this requirement. And these are slides you can see, and I will conclude uh, this. Uh, uh, we have a, a kind of supercomputer chip, which is based on a poor uh, quality, uh, energy efficiency, uh, 
scalability of performance, execution predictability, and uh, ease of use. Thank you. While we're waiting for uh, some questions, can we just take a look at the performance results and give us an idea of how this compares to, say, a GPU? So um, these are examples we, we did. Uh, we are working today on a, on a, a trading platform, but before that, we were working on a, an application uh, which was uh, related to a, a high frequency trading. It was option pricing. So uh, these are the results. And uh, we got uh, a speed up, especially in the area of the uh, uh, so the number, uh, the uh, random number gener generation here by using the Merson uh, Twister uh, algorithm because you have to provide a, a high, uh, high uh, quantity and uh, velocity of a pseudo random number. So, uh, in fact, we compare to GPU uh, if we compare head to head on a pure floating point or pure peak performance, uh, we, are, we are not competitive. When we apply to a case where a GPU suffer from a, a control flow divergence or, or, or memory addressing divergence, or, or you have a, uh, all the effect to, to, to take care of, uh, then uh, we, we see a, um, a significant improvement. Uh, I didn't uh, put in those uh, slides what we did in uh, video encodings. We were demonstrating this at CS. Uh, uh, 2013, we were the only software platform to do real-time HEVC 60 frame uh, 4K uh, at this time. You showed uh, as part of your software um, stack. Is the expectation that's more CUDA-like in programming model or something different? Um, in fact, it's a kind of surprise. Um, we started this stack, and we were expecting that uh, the most interest would be in a uh, GPU uh, style use. And so uh, initially, we, we, we built this machine for data flow, didn't get much traction, so we uh, refocused on GPU like uh, programming, uh, OpenCL because it's open, and OpenCL because now it's, uh, you apply to a, a bunch of accelerators, be it FPGA, uh, DSP, uh, GPU, obviously, and, and, and uh, multi cores. But we see that in embedded applications, first our customer says, we will only use your processor if we can program it like a GPU. And after they said, now we want to use your, your, your machine in other way. We want to use each compute cluster as a small multi-core, and we want uh, your chip to be a small case, a, a reduced case of a Xeon Phi class of machine. So uh, we have both uh, requests. And just as a final question, uh, can you give us a, a view of what you see as the future for your product? In fact, it's, uh, it's an open uh, question, and uh, we are in a, in a split point. Either it will go more to cloud and uh, data center acceleration, but there is a lot of competition, or will it go more into high-performance embedded computing? So uh, we don't know which one will win. Unfortunately, for the next uh, chip, we will have to do uh, two different tape out. All right, let's thank the speaker one more time. All right, now.